Sunday morning, we uh, finally got us a little bit of fall weather coming our way. Very grateful for that. And so uh, we're just excited to be in the house of the Lord, to be able to worship our Lord Jesus today. And so uh, if you're here today, if you're visiting with us, maybe, maybe it's your first time, we want to welcome you. Uh, we'll, we'll have a little more information for you later in um, the service. There's always a, a connect card in the chair back in front of you. If you want to fill out some information for us for a first time guest, we'd love to have that. And church members, don't forget, those are for prayer requests as well. We pray for you. So if you have a prayer need, please write those things down. And uh, so anyway, we're going to continue today. We're going to get started with some worship. So let's stand together as we worship the Lord Jesus. Let's sing this together. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore. what tomorrow brings with each morning i'll rise and see my god's love will see me through you are the peace in my trouble see oh you are the peace in my trouble see my lighthouse my lighthouse shining in the darkness I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise that you will carry me safe to shore. before us you're the brightest you will lead us through the storm hey fire before us you're the brightest you will lead us through the storm hey fire before us you're the brightest you will lead us through the storm the promise you will carry me safe to shore He's going to lead us in a, in a welcome, and he's going to share a little bit of an update with, uh, about and from our friends with Eternal Bread Ministry. Morning, church. 
So when I look over here, it was like, oh, good morning, Terry. What you want now? <laughs> so f for the ones who don't know me, um, as you see, there's no pages in front of me. So I speak. I'm spirit-led. Holy Spirit tells me what to say, and I, I am very obedient, okay? So I am Terry Muhammad. Um, the Lord has called my wife and I into full-time ministry called Eternal Bread Ministry. Uh, he has only called my wife and I, but he has called several people from our church and churches around Memphis that supports us, be it from groceries, be it from uh, hygiene bags or snack bags or whatever it may be. We have a lot of people that helps us and support us. Um, as the Holy Spirit is speaking, I'm going to tell you that, you know, it's difficult to talk about uh, Christ at um, schools, right? Well, Cordova High School contacted us and said, hey, we want to make some blessing bags for you guys and hygiene bags. Ain't that Jesus at work? So don't miss it. Don't miss the small blessings that comes our way, right? Um, in a couple of slides, you're going to see where, you know, our mission field really on my next slide will tell us that, um, you know, that we do not, you know, work for food. And we don't gather all our gifts and finances over here. And we don't pocket it and just for our selfishness. But we, we, but we do it and we give it on to man. We give it on to like how Jesus told us to do it. He told us to go and give, right? He told us to go share the gospel of, 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 of him, right? He didn't say to be selfish about it, did he? You see, people, Christians, we, we make it very, very difficult to serve. You know why? Because we... Some of us, you know, we're going to tell people, hey, if you don't, if you don't come and follow Jesus, you're going to go to hell. The Lord didn't say that. The Lord told us as he was going to the cross, he says, go. Go tell people about me. Go tell them about my goodness. Win them over to, to, to uh, Christianity, to come to know the Lord as Savior. The Lord told us to go baptize them in his name. Guess what? He did tell us to come to church. He did, he did tell us to tie it to the church. He did tell us to give freely. Because all comes from him. Amen? Some of you are scared to say amen for that one because you want to still hold on to what is not yours. Okay? My church, if you're holding on, the Holy Spirit just told me to tell you to do this. Put your hand out like this. Clench it. Right? You're clinching it, you let it go, flip it over, and you give it to the Lord. Let go and let God. Amen? Amen. So we're going to show you a couple of slides on eternal bread ministry next. Uh, this is very small, so with my blindness, I'm going to look over here. Um, in 2023, we gave almost 14,000 meals. You know, every Sunday, you smell that good cook in there. Um, we go out and we, give, we share meals. We drive around Memphis. Uh, on a mobile ministry uh, route, and we give food and we meet people. Uh, we give out, we give out approximately, f say, 5,000 bags, snack bags, and hygiene bags. We can, we can shower every day at our house. Our friends on the street, they wait for that little hygiene bag from us. See, um, I'm led to tell you that um, Eternal Bread Ministry, we, we don't give them cash. We have people who come all the time, and they want to get us to pay the MLG and W bill. That's not what we, what we led to do. Okay, we're not, we're not led to give somebody $2 to go buy a beer, okay? But we're led to give somebody a bag and tell them that Jesus loves them. we led to ask them, hey, what's your name? My name is Jane. Jane, can I pray for you this week? Okay? I'm going to share a little short testimony before I continue with this, okay? I am very bad with names. But it is fun to go and see a brother or sister on the street and say, hey, how was your week? It's fun to go and see, like, my brother Raul over here, okay? I remember him too well because that he's part of my living testimony. Raul asked, this, asked me to come back to the church and say, hey, I need some stuff to keep me warm. This church set up like that, and they gave it to us, and we bless Raul. Raul today, let me tell you where he's... You, do you know where Raul, Raul is at today? He is with Jesus. Amen. He passed away into, into glory. That affected my testimony because I miss my brother. I do. He's a man from Memphis that 
a lot of people scorned and hated. But the Lord led us to, to this man, and he showed us Christ. He knew his Bible. He wanted to be an American so bad. But you know, for, for some of us who judge people who's, who come to this country, I'm one of it. Um, that man wanted to be an American. He wanted to know, let people know about Jesus. But guess what? Today now, he's in glory and he's, he's celebrating with Jesus. Amen? Amen? We can flip over, sis. So a couple of slides here is um, what we do um, at Jackson Avenue. You know, Jackson Avenue and Well Station and Jackson Avenue Auto Zone there. A lot of the guys in here know that place too well because that's where you go to pick up your day labor, all right? You can stop right there, sis. So we have, you know, we have a little job at the house. We want to go pick up some Mexicans to work, right? Well, let me tell you what the Lord led us to do. The Lord led us to go there. You see that picture right there? It's AutoZone, a mattress store, and Family Dollar. That Family Dollar store there, right? They spent over $2 million to, to renovate that place and get it street worthy for us. For the, for the community to come and shop. In two weeks' time, that, that place went out of business. You see, the groceries that we, I was highlighting there earlier today, we, this year we've done almost 3,500 um, grocery giveaway there. You may say, oh, that's ridiculous. You may say that, no, 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 Christ Church, a help group alone does that. No, sir. The Lord gave us through our help group here to go there and give to our family on the streets. You see, the family dollar store there is their grocery store, and their grocery store was shut down. So we are their lifeline. You are their lifeline. How, how you are your life, their lifeline if you just sit there every, every week? By your giving, by your financial support, more so by your prayer for these people. My guy here on, on the right side there, the old guy with the brown um, jacket, some of you all have prayed that man back to life. He had a stroke and he was dying. And Clarence now is alive, well, and kicking. And he's going to wait. He's going to wait today for one thing. And Dion is not going to be there. He's going to ask Dion, uh, uh, all of us, where's my biscuit? <laughs> That's all he wants. He wants Rick's biscuit. He wants that biscuit that you all didn't take today, and he is going to wait, and he is going to wait, and he's going to come in my face as we unload the truck, and where's my biscuit? <laughs> you know what that is? That's a connection made in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? The simple things that we do to people, and we throw it at them, and we don't care, they take it for joy. So church, as you sit there and you judge what I'm doing up here, I just sit there and go like, Terry, no, nah, it's all about Terry. No, sir. It's all about Jesus and what he led us to do. Amen. I was reminded this morning that my testimony, a Muslim guy who came from Trinidad, my brother Ron C. Trinidad, we came from, from similar backgrounds, different religions, and today we could stand up and boast and testify anywhere we go but Jesus. It's not about him. It's not about me but Jesus. So we can keep going again. So this here, um, this here is a part of my testimony where uh, I told my folks last year and a half ago, maybe, Dion, that if you're happy where you're at, meaning if you're happy sitting here and being a bench or all my church, be that. Okay? I told, I told Eternal Bread Ministry if you're not happy and it's time to get out your comfort zone, do that. The Lord will guide you. Guys, I had seven years before I had to pay off for the, for, for my, the mortgage on my house. And through the spirit of my wife and the, and the Holy Spirit, we sold the house and we bought another house. But then the Lord led us to build that there with, with, with people, people's giving. We built that storage at our house right now. It's not completed. But all the groceries that we've been getting, all the gifts that we've been getting, all the drinks we've been getting, we have to find a place to store it, right? Because some of y'all complain about how the break room is over full sometimes. And you can't get to the snack machine. Because snack is very important for you, amen? But here's what. So that there, you can see that the driveway is still, still under with um, gravel and, and mud. The unit is not finished. 
I need at least $7,000 to finish it. I can't do it on my own, but the Lord said he will do it. He will provide. Here I am today, I'm telling you. The most you can do for us right now in Eternal Bread Ministry, Eternal Bread Ministry being your family on the streets, okay? Your church family, Terry and Dion, pray for us. The most you can do today. And if you want to be a blessing, financial blessing onto the ministry, please do so. Because we anxiously and desperately need it. Just like your church home. Your church home last week Sunday we heard that the giving is down. Your church home needs finances. Okay? And it comes from you. That came from the Lord. So we can keep going. So here it is. A changed life. I didn't ask for permission to, to show this slide here to you all today. But it's a young lady sitting right here, Miss Anisha. I call her Nisha. That young lady there will go on Jackson Avenue in the winter time. She'll be with layers of clothes on. We will give her everything that we have, we want to give Nisha to take it home to her, to her family and friends at her house. But see, Nisha was struggling. See, Nisha is staying in a home where, she, where, where it was an abusive um, relationship. Nisha was, is staying at a home right now where there's a lot of people doing drugs. But we prayed, you all prayed for, the, for, for this changed life there. This picture on the right of her, that's where Nisha is praising and, and, and receiving a blessing from one of our servants at Eternal Bread Ministry. I tell you about a changed life. I tell you about something that this, lady, this young lady has an opportunity to leave that home right now. You know what she says? No, I'm going to stay there. You know why she's going to stay there? There's what, six or seven more people at the houses. They need prayer. They need to see Nisha, a born again. They want to see, they, they, they need to see her as a living testimony for Jesus Christ. So she chooses to stay there. And what you all could do, church, more is the most you can do for her? Pray for her. Pray for her because she is going to need it. The temptation is there. Okay? And you all did that. The Lord tells us that if you are the only one, Nisha, he would have come for you. And he delivered you. So I want to tell you that you're a blessing unto to the Lord and be a true blessing. Amen? Amen. So church, you know, as we could go up just a little bit more. These names here, we go every Sunday and we ask people at uh, the mobile ministry with Mark and Day or on Jackson Avenue. And we ask just for one thing. Simple. Hey, what's your name? And how can I pray for you? Amen. My name is Nisha. I'm addicted to drugs and I'm living in a bad relationship and in a bad home. Please pray for me. And guess what? You all could do that every Sunday. If you all want to know how to receive those, um, those names, come and talk to Dion or myself. I'm also Dion. She's more, more with it. Talk, talk to us. There's an app that you can get on. You'll receive those names every week, and you can pray for them. So as I close right now, I want to tell you something. I'm asking you to pray for myself and Dion. I'm asked to pray for a marriage. Nothing is wrong, but I'll ask you to pray because as we do the Lord's work, it gets lonely. It gets hard. Although we're doing exciting things in the name of Jesus, okay, we pull in many directions. And I say that smiling because I know that the Lord has more in store for us. I don't know what it is. But I just showed you a storage at my house that I need, I need to, to put electricity on there. I know that he has more in store for, for us. He has more in store for you. So please, the most that you can do for us today is to do what? Pray. And if you're so led to financially support us, come and ask us how you can do that. But before you support Eternal Bread Ministry, 
figure out your house first. The church needs your blessing first. We need to tithe at our church. Amen? Amen. So as we go back into worship, and let me just close with a, with a prayer. And again, I love you all. And I say this all the time candidly. The ones who are gossiping about me and saying how bad it is and the kitchen is a mess and, and, and that, you know, the food smells good and Terry this and Terry that, I love it. You know why? Because as you gossip about me, the, the Lord is saying, hallelujah, my son is doing something in my name. Amen. So call my name out more. Call, please call my name out more. And I know somebody, somebody was affected by that statement because the Spirit is in your right now telling you to do more. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, okay? Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord. I thank you for um, such a time as, as this, Lord. Father, just, I pray that someone here in this room right now who does not know you as their Lord and Savior will come forward today and sing a, a, a song of salvation and submit to you. I pray today that someone in this church right now, in this congregation right now, who has been a bench warmer, who has been here just checking the box, and they want to get more involved, that they will not leave this room today without talking to Marcus or someone to say, hey, what can I do within the body of Christ? What can I do in this church right now? Lord, I just pray for our living testimony as we grow in your faith and trust in you and you alone. And Father God, I pray for the week that you have um, already planned for us, Lord. I pray for all the blessings, especially the ones that we take for granted, Lord. And Lord, I pray for the ones that is going to be tough. I pray for the ones that we, we give the enemy the glory, which we should not. But the ones that are tough, Lord, that we may seek your guidance through it. And we run to you daily, and we sing hallelujah unto your name in any and everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. One thing I forgot to mention, we did say it last week. I, it didn't hit the bulletin last week. But please don't go home after church. Don't run out of here. Come in the gym. Come and have lunch with us, please, okay? We, we did prepare a spaghetti dinner. I, take not, I didn't do anything where that's concerned, but we have some great cooks in Eternal Bread Ministry. Come and have lunch with us. Come and learn a little bit more. Come and ask more questions. If, not, if nothing else, come and have a great meal. Amen? Amen. Thank you all. Amen. Thank you, Terry. At the, at the very foundation of who we are. Thank you, Terry. At the very foundation of who we are is that we always come back to understanding that we are a child of God. We are a child of God, and we have a Heavenly Father who loves us. So no matter how old you are today, you're still a child, you're still his son, you're still his daughter, and that's what this next song is all about. So I want you to stand with us as we continue to praise our Savior together. And let's uh, show Jesus some love because Anisha, who Terry talked about today, she is over one month clean, and she starts her new job tonight. He brought me in, oh, 
said if the son sets you free that you shall be free indeed amen
These next lines are some of the most powerful that I know. So God does not owe us anything, but he gave us everything. Thank you, Lord. And we owe him everything. But we should, he wants us more than anything. I want us to sing this in faith. to rely on you for all the things that we need, all the things that we want, Lord. We just ask you, Lord Jesus, to be here this morning, to be here in this worship service, Lord, to be here at the, the, the word that Marcus is bringing, Lord Jesus. Open our hearts and our ears to you. Lord, we love you, and we want you more than anything. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. 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 So glad to be back with you guys. Uh, my wife and I were out of town last week and traveling a little bit, trying to watch my son Vance play. Uh, he's a college football player, so he's on the road a good bit. And uh, so sometimes some long, long road trips, but they're well worth it. We understand the, uh, you know, the, um, the privilege, I guess it is, to be able to, to do something like that and uh, a very short window for us to enjoy these years. And so um, it's always glad to be back. We, um, my dad and I actually traveled up to Cape Girardeau last, last night for um, his football game. Uh, and it's not too far. Cape Girardeau is about three hours uh, roughly from here. Um, and so, uh, you know, we thought normally I was kind of gauging what time am I going to get back? It's going to be a late night getting back after midnight or something like that. Well, we ended up going into double overtime last night. Um, and we lost, which made it even worse, but uh, it was a very exciting, fantastic game, but 
Needless to say, I did not get back till wee hours of the morning, so I am running on uh, a little bit of a lack of sleep today. But you know, I'm, I'm very excited, very energized, and, and thankful to be here uh, with you. And, and thinking about just sleep itself, it, it's really what the title of my message is all about. It, the, the message today is very one that is very, very simple. It, it's don't get caught sleeping. And <clears throat> we're going to see this from the book of 2 Peter chapter 3 today. And Peter is going to use this, this illustration or this analogy about a thief in the night. Okay? A thief in the night. Being surprised when the thief comes as opposed to being alert and awake and ready when the thief comes. And so, you know, sleep is... <clears throat> It's such an interesting concept. Have you ever stopped and just wondered, you know, every night we basically lay down and, and kind of die. You're just totally oblivious to the world. Like, you're, you're just unconscious. I mean, I know we take it for granted. Like, we got to get our sleep, and good sleep is important, and we need to rest for our bodies, and our body heals and repairs, and it's so very vital to us, but you know, we take for granted it's like when we lay our head down at night and go to sleep, there's really no guarantee that we're gonna what? We're gonna wake up in the morning. I mean, it's really an act of faith. I mean, who keeps your circulatory system going while you're asleep? You don't. It's involuntary, right? I mean, it's just amazing. We take little things like that for granted, but the Lord is keeping us alive and our heart beating within our chest, and we're still breathing, we're not thinking about it. But you're just in this unconscious state, and it's just so fascinating to me. I don't know why. I mean, something as simple as sleep, it just, it just blows my mind away sometimes when we really think about what we're doing, and we have to do it every single day to recharge, and, and all of that is so very important. And I thought it was ironic that when we look in the Scriptures, there's a couple of times in Scripture where I think it's telling that we find people sleeping. You know, there's a song that Casting Crowns wrote years ago. It's usually sung around Christmas time. It's called While You Were Sleeping. It's a great song. And the whole premise to the song is like, you know, when Jesus the Messiah was born into the world and came into that little town of Bethlehem, everybody was what? Everybody was asleep. Except maybe the, the shepherds, right? The shepherds in the fields that were out watching their flocks by night. You know, they were awake. They had to be awake. They were pulling the night shift, you know, the graveyard. But everybody was asleep. It's like so many people, you know, missed it, if, you know, if you look at it that way. And they were asleep in their beds and really oblivious to had any, had any idea that anything like that was going on. When the Son of God was actually born into this world, He came when almost everybody in that local community and really in that entire in that land, they were asleep. And then the other time that sleep comes to mind is, is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember what he asked his disciples? He says, I need you to what? Just stay awake. Like, I know you're tired, but guys, can you please just stay awake? And what was his asking? What was his purpose in them staying awake so that they could what? Pray. Watch him pray. Like Jesus was in his, his most excruciating moment of agony and he's, he's pouring his heart out to God. He's sweating drops of blood, just feeling the, the oncoming agony of the cross, knowing what he's about to undergo. And he has his friends there with him. He's like, hey guys, I really need you. I really need you just to hang with me a little bit longer. And please just, just stay awake so that you can pray for me and pray with me. And he goes away to spend time with the Father, and, and then he comes back and he finds them what? They're all asleep. And you know what? They're human. They were tired. And I get it. But what we see here in the book of 2 Peter today is that this is going to be, maybe, for some of you, a radically different interpretation of what you've probably, maybe you've heard before or, or what you've been taught before about this idea about the Lord, the day of the Lord coming like a what? A thief in the night. And you're going to see here in Peter, and we're going to look at several other passages, some from Jesus. Paul, Paul addresses this very, uses this very same theme. We're going to see that here in just a minute. 
But we're going to see how very important this is because the, the core message, the core central theme of what Jesus and Peter and Paul and the apostles, what they're trying to communicate to us is that when it comes to our spiritual responsibility, especially as we live longer and the days become closer to the end of the age and, and, the, and, the, and the coming of the Lord is, is more and more at hand, which we, we know that's true. I mean, it has to be true. It's closer today than it was tomorrow. But Jesus and Peter and the apostles, they're trying to, to help us understand, especially for the, that generation that's going to be living in, in perhaps those, those last days, and He's reminding us how so very important it is that we are... That, and, it, and again, it's not necessarily physical sleep. We need our physical sleep. God understands that. But what is He talking about? He's saying we make sure that we're not spiritually what? Asleep. That spiritually speaking, that we're awake and that we're alert, and that we're ready and prepared to see the Lord, to meet the Lord, to receive the Lord when He does return. So I'm going to show you today that this passage of Scripture may be fundamentally radically different than, than maybe some, something that you have learned or that you have believed or that you've been taught in the past. And I think it, it speaks to our heart today and it speaks to us exactly where we are in what we would consider to be these last days. And so look with me in 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to read verses 10 through 13 this morning as we jump in. Second Peter 3. I'm going to begin in verse 10. <clears throat> but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away, and I don't really like that translation, the, the word there, I'll get into this later, but the word there is dissolve, okay? It means to dissolve. It says, the heavens will dissolve with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, there's that word again, dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed, okay? Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved... Here's your question. What sort of people ought you to be living lives of holiness and godliness as we wait for and hasten the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and there it is again, and what? Dissolved. And the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, but according to His promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So let's jump right in here. The first thing that I want to share with you today is that let's talk about what is Jesus talking, what is He trying to, to communicate to us when He's telling us this, this illustration, using this analogy about the day of the Lord, okay? We're talking about the, the return of Christ to the earth, okay? This is... This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? I mean, the, the things that we're reading about in this passage have to be the end of the end, right? I mean, the, the heavens are being dissolved and the, the elements are being burned with fire and everything on the earth is being exposed and, and, and we're waiting for this new heaven and new earth. I mean, this is the end. I, I don't think it's a stretch to, 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 to say that, that we're talking about the end when Jesus, what? When He returns, right? And so now He's using this illustration about a thief. And so this is what I want you guys to get from this. Jesus will return like a thief in the night for all who are spiritually what? Asleep and unprepared. Now if you were like me, you grew up in a church that taught that Jesus is coming like a thief which means that He could come at any, any moment. Nobody knows. And we, and we use that language to comfort ourselves. Again, coming up in, in the church, this is what I believe, and this is what I was taught, that you know that Jesus could just come today, He could come tomorrow, He could come right now, any time, that nobody knows, and uh, it could happen, it's gonna, when it happens, it's going to happen like a what? Like a thief. Just quick, just surprise. And, and we use that verse to comfort God's people, 
because of the, you know, again, because of the viewpoint of, of the, the differing opinions about the return of the Lord. And I'm not going to get down, I'm not going to get into the whole debate about the, the pre-tribulation rapture and the post-tribulation rapture. I'm not, I'm not going to really talk about that today. But I want you to see that what Jesus is telling us here in this passage is so very clear. Is that his coming like a thief is a negative thing. It's not a what? It's not a positive thing. So that may cause us to pause for a minute and say, wait a minute, so when, he's, when he uses the illustration that he's coming like a thief, he's talking about people who are spiritually what? Asleep. They're not looking for him. They're not prepared to meet their maker. And so if we're looking at it from that perspective, then we need to understand that when Jesus is warning us that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, He's doing that as a warning for us, for God's people, by telling us that it's going to be a uh-oh, big surprise, I wasn't ready, here comes Jesus, and it's too what? It's too late. I missed it. I wasn't prepared. And so, I want to share some, some other Scriptures with you because this theme, again, it runs all throughout the Gospels, the epistles, we see this repeated over and over and over again. So let me just read a couple of passages with you just to, just to again, to, to, to prove this, this point. And I'm going I'm to show why this is so important for you and me this morning. So in Luke chapter 12, Jesus is teaching. If you want to turn there, feel free. We're going to be in Luke 12, verse 35, just for a minute. So I want to show you the language of Jesus. And again, Peter undoubtedly is picking up on the language of Jesus, just as Paul will be here in just a minute. All right, listen to the words of Jesus. This is Luke 12, verse 35. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. If your lamp is burning at night, that means you're what? Awake. You turn the lights out when it's time to go to sleep. Got it? Jesus is clear. Keep your lamps burning. Then you will be like servants waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door for him at once. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds on watch when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve and will have them recline at the table, and he, the master, will himself come and wait on them. That's a whole other fascinating picture that Jesus is going to serve us when he returns. I've, I've talked about that before. It just blows me away. He's going to tell us to sit down and he's going to serve us. <laughs> Amazing. Look at verse 38. Even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night and finds them what? Alert. Alert. Awake. Those servants will be what? Blessed. Verse 39. But understand this. If the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour that you do not expect. Again, translation, what is Jesus saying here? The thief that comes in the, night, in the night is a negative connotation. If we're spiritually asleep and not ready and not watching and not waiting and not prepared, then we will be caught off guard, we will get caught sleeping, and we will, we will be surprised. And it will be a very unpleasant surprise. That's what Jesus is trying to communicate to us. So if you see the language, what is He telling us to do? Stay awake. Keep your lamps burning. Watch. Wait. Be ready. Look for it. Even if it's the second or the third watch of the night. You know that His return is what? It's near. You're expecting the Master to come home from the bank. You know, you calculate the days He had to go away for a wedding banquet. He's got to be coming back in a general time frame, right? You know, they don't know the exact day or hour He's going he's to actually pull up to the house. You understand that, right? But they have a pretty good idea about the gen. You know, it may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. You know, it may even be within the week when he returns. Maybe he gets delayed or whatever. But he's not going to be delayed like for a year. You understand that, right? So they're waiting and they're preparing and they're watching. So they know the general time frame. They're expecting the master to come back. And when it gets closer and closer, that gives them more motive, more incentive to be that much more alert and awake and ready and prepared, and they should be waiting and watching. Amen. Now, I'm going to read a couple more verses to you. In the book of Revelation, 
Jesus writing to the church in Sardis. <clears throat> in Revelation 3, listen to this. It says, These are the words of the one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Talking of Jesus, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, yet you are dead. He says, Wake up. And strengthen what remains, which was about to die, for I have found your deeds incomplete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. Again, is that a positive connotation or negative? It's a negative connotation. In other words, we don't want to be the people who are surprised when Jesus returns like a what? Like a thief. It's not a good thing. It's a negative thing, guys, that we're seeing here. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know the hour when I will come upon you. Same thing that we see in Revelation chapter 3 and then later in Revelation 16, Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who remains awake and clothed so that he will not go naked and let his shame be exposed. So I think it, it couldn't be any clearer. Every time that this analogy, this illustration is used in Scripture, whether it's Paul, it's Jesus, it's John, it's Peter, they're, they're trying to get our attention and say, listen, Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night for those people. It's going to seem to them like a major surprise because they're going to be spiritually what? Asleep. They're not ready. They're not prepared. They're not watching. They're not waiting. They're not praying. They're not pursuing the Lord. So this is a very negative thing that we're talking about. So that's a, that's a big deal. Because I was taught my whole life that when Jesus comes like a thief, it's the best day of our life because we go, whew, we disappear and all go to heaven. It's not what it says. This is a solemn day. This is a, a dreadful day. The coming of the Lord is a, is a dreadful day for those who are not what? Who are not prepared, who are not ready. Amen. So that, that's, what I, that's what I'm trying to get you to understand here. This is probably radically different than anything that maybe you've, you've heard or been taught. So, what, so the next point that, that really follows this naturally, the natural progression of this, is this. Listen to what my next point says. It says, so those who are awake and watching will not be what? Surprised. It's not going to be a surprise. We're not going to be caught off guard. Like we're waiting for the Master. We know that His return is near. We're watching. We're, we're, we're waiting. We're praying. We're ready. We're prepared. And so that when He does come, guess what? We're like, we were, we were expecting that. We were expecting Him to come. We're not asleep. We're, we're, we're not surprised when the Lord Jesus returns. So guys, here's what we're doing. We're looking at two contrasting groups of people. And, and the church can, you know, when I say the church, we're talking about believers in Jesus Christ. And, you know, can you be a believer in Jesus Christ and kind of be, um, I don't want to use the word backslidden, but maybe, maybe um, compromised a little bit or, or wandered away from the Lord a little bit. And maybe you've kind of gotten wrapped up in the world and maybe you've distanced yourself from God and, and you're just kind of out there, you know, spiritually asleep? Can you be a Christian, a believer, and be kind of spiritually asleep? I think so. Some of us need to get a jolting. Some of us need to get a, a wake-up call. God is trying to get our attention in so many different ways. Sometimes it's a personal thing that happens to us. It gets our attention. Sometimes it's a, it's a collective thing or a, a tragedy or a disaster or a war or a financial loss or, or death of a loved one or whatever it may be. Sometimes God uses these things to get our attention and get us back on track and get us back to the Lord because we've drifted away and we've fallen asleep and we're not ready and we're not prepared. It doesn't mean that you're lost. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be saved. I'm not saying that. If you're a believer in Christ Jesus, you're saved. You're secure in that salvation. But what I am saying is that many of God's people need to what? Wake up. Amen. Including myself. Wake up. And so the, 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 the contrast here is that for the world, for the people who are living in darkness, the people that are spiritually asleep, people who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, He's going to come to them like a what? Thief in the night. They're not ready. They're not prepared. They're not watching. But for those of us who are 
His, for those of us who are ready, for those of us who are awake, for those of us who are waiting and watching and prepared for the Lord Jesus Christ, He will not surprise us like a what? You get me? Let me prove it to you. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So you can read 2 Peter 3 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, almost par- they're almost parallel passages. And when I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul, Paul makes it clear as it can be. First Thessalonians 5, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, Now about the times and seasons, brothers, we do not need to write to you, for you are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Same thing, right? Now listen to what he says. While people are saying peace and security, everything's fine. What are you talking about? Didn't we read about that earlier in 2 Peter 3? You know, mockers and scoffers are going to come. In the last days, and what are they going to be saying? Why do you keep talking about this return of Jesus business? Everything's gone on the same as it has ever since the beginning of creation. You guys are a bunch of looney tune religious kooks. I'm so tired of hearing about Jesus is going to return. You've been talking about that for 2,000 years. What a joke. Everything's what? Everything's fine. We're all good. Peace and security. I got money in my pocket. Everything's fine. See, this is the mentality of the world. And Paul tells us here that while people are saying peace and security, what will happen? Destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains on a pregnant woman. And they, who? They will not escape. Who's they? The people who are spiritually asleep. Who are lost. Who are in darkness. They will not escape. Destruction will come. Now look at what he says. The next line. Listen, read with me carefully. Verse, verse 4. But you, brothers, now who is he talking to? He's not talking about they. Who is he talking to now? To you and me, us. But you, brothers, if you're here and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're one of God's children, he says, you, brothers, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you like a thief. In other words, if you're a believer in Jesus and you're waiting and you're ready and you're prepared and you're watching and you're awake, you will not be overtaken and surprised like a thief. For you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us remain awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, love, and the helmet of our hope of salvation. And so guys, I want, I want to just, again, just reiterate what, what Paul and what Peter and what Jesus are talking about here is basically this. You don't want to be caught off guard like, a, like when Jesus comes like a what? Like a thief in the night. That's not a good day for you. If He comes like a thief in the night and you're not ready and you're asleep and you're not awake and you're not prepared. So all the more, that means we should be awake and prepared and ready and praying and watching, and waiting, and looking. And what Peter even says, which is fascinating, he says that we're waiting for and hastening the day. Hastening the day of the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know what hastening means? It means we're speeding it up. You know how I believe we hasten the day of the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, I believe that Jesus and God, they know that He's... Why, does, why is He patient with us? Remember what we said a few weeks ago? God is... He's not slow in keeping His promise, but He's patient with us because He wants everyone to come to what? Repentance. He wants everybody to come to repentance. So how do we hasten the day of the Lord as we go and share the Gospel and make disciples and, be, and we're His witnesses and fulfilling the Great Commission? The more and more people that we reach for the Gospel of for the Lord Jesus Christ with His Gospel and the more people repent, guess what we're doing? We're speeding up the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ because He's trying to give people more what? 
more time. So if we're out there doing our job like we're supposed to do, He'll come back sooner. I believe that. Because He's patient with us and He's so kind. And so we see this, guys, in the Scripture. It's so very important that we understand this. We need to be consistent in our, uh, in our call to make disciples and we hasten the day and we're ready for the Lord's return and we're not as spiritually asleep like the rest of the world. Now, I want to spend just a second talking about this idea that the veil between heaven and earth will dissolve, okay? I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but Peter mentions this, and I want to see, again, another theme, because, again, what are we talking about in this passage of Scripture? This is the end. If this is not the end, then I don't know what else could be the end. This passage right here is describing for us the day that Jesus comes from heaven to the earth, the sky is split open or rolls back like a scroll, uh, the elements are on fire, the world's on fire, Jesus is coming in fire, He's coming to judge the living and the dead. Like, this is the end. This has to be the end. And I'm going to show you why that is in just a second. So guys, what's going to happen? What we see in Scripture is that, if you remember, in Adam, when Adam and Eve walked with the Lord in the garden, I believe what we see here in that, in that picture that man, heaven and earth at one time, heaven and earth, were completely in harmony with one another. What, what's, the, what's the one thing God promises us in the new heaven and new earth? He says, I will be your God and you will be my people. It says that God will dwell with us. God wants to dwell with us again. In the garden, in the beginning, before sin and the curse entered into the world, what was God doing with mankind? He was dwelling. There was paradise. God was fellowshipping and dwelling with man. There was, and, again, and again, hear me, there was no separation between what? Heaven and earth. There was no separation. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve sinned. They're banned from the garden. Remember, they're cast out of paradise. They're cast out of the New Jerusalem, basically. It's what that is. The, the holy mountain of God. They're cast out. They put, the Lord put cherubim at the gate of the garden so that nobody else could come back in. And so at that moment, when Adam and Eve sinned and, and they were cast out of God's presence, what happened, guys? A veil. It's an invisible veil. Can we see it? It's not like you can touch it. But a veil was put in place to separate heaven and earth. Why do you think the temple and the tabernacle had a what before you go into the Holy of Holies? What did it have? A massive veil, a curtain. What happened when Jesus was crucified? The veil in the temple was what? Torn back open, signifying access to God again, right? There's a veil. There's an invisible veil. And what we see here in Peter, and again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but I just want to show you a few verses, is that this invisible veil that has been established between heaven and earth, it's going to dissolve when Jesus is revealed from heaven. Now, the Bible talks about that the sky will be rolled up like a what? Like a scroll. Here's the image I want you to get in your mind. You ever take a piece of paper and you take a lighter or a match and you light the end of that paper? What does that paper start to do? It starts to fold up on itself as it what? As it burns. It rolls up like a scroll. This veil that's invisible, I don't understand it all. I don't pretend to understand it all, but it's there because we can't see into heaven, can we? We can't see across to the other side. It, the, the, angel, the angelic beings... The spiritual world, the unseen realm, if you want to put it to that way, it's there, it's here, it's somewhere, right? It's probably a lot closer than we, than we know. We just can't what? You can't see it. Well, when Jesus comes back, guess what's going to happen? That veil, that invisible barrier that's preventing us from being able to see into the heavens, that's going to what? It's going to burn away and dissolve like a what? Like a scroll. And we, for the first time, since the garden are going to be what? We're going to be able to see everything. And boy, can you imagine what kind of a sight that's going to be. Amen. We're going to be able to see the unseen realm. Namely, Jesus. 
And so this word dissolved is used over and over in this passage as Peter talks about the, the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be dissolved. Everything will be dissolved. And again, this association with the fire of God, this, this burning away of this invisible veil between heaven and earth, it says we, it will be dissolved by fire and the elements will, meet, will melt in heat. Jesus said in Matthew 22, excuse me, 24, heaven and earth will what? Pass away. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean they're going to be done away with. It just means they're going to be transformed. The, the present state of the universe and the, and the curse of creation is going, to, it's going to dissolve. It's going to be refined. It's going to pass away. But my words, Jesus said, will never pass away. The sky will be rolled up like a scroll. The psalmist says the heavens will vanish like smoke and the earth will wear out like a garment. And so what we see is that when this veil is dissolved, this veil is removed, we're going to be able to see things that we've never seen before. And namely, it's going to be the Lord Jesus coming out of heaven to the earth on the day of the Lord. He's, going, he's coming to wage war. We know He's coming to destroy the wicked. And He's coming to give us new bodies. He's coming to resurrect the dead to life, to give us glorified bodies. I mean, this, this is the glorious day of the Lord, again, for those people who are in relationship with God. Now then Peter finishes this passage by reminding us in verse 13 that according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, let me ask you a question. God will create a new heaven and new earth for us to dwell with Him forever. Practically speaking, one thing we, we oftentimes forget, why does God need to create a new heaven and a new earth? Well, let's ask ourselves this question. If the elements are going to melt in fervent heat, that sounds pretty extreme to me. If you know what's going to happen in the days of the time of the end before the returning of the Lord, these are things that are going to happen on the earth. You ready? I know this is, this is heavy stuff for us to remember, but we need to understand what's the condition of the earth going to be like. Let's be reminded. All the waters on the earth are going to be turned to what? To blood. Anybody want to live in that world? All that fish and the animals in the sea are going to what? Can you imagine the smell? All the fresh water is going to be poisoned. That's what the Bible tells us. This is what's going to happen before the return of the Lord. There's going to be fire and drought and vegetation on the earth. There's going to be burnt trees and fields and vegetation are going to be completely what? Burned down. There's going to be earthquakes so massive that the, the islands are going to move out of their place. The mountains are going to what? Crumble and fall. Just massive fractures of the earth. I mean... The, the, whole, the whole earth is just going to be in a complete, total mess. We're going to have tsunamis crashing the, the coastlines. And let's not forget the countless number of people, the dead. There's going to be a lot of dead people, guys. I know it's, it's hard for us to wrap up. I mean, you, people say, I don't like it when you preach about this stuff, Brother Marcus. I get it, but it's in the, it's in the book, guys. I don't, I don't know what else to tell you. And, they, and, and Peter and Paul and Jesus and John, they talk about it all the time. They must think it's important. I, I don't know. I don't like talking about it. But let's not forget, this is going to be the condition of the world when Jesus what? Return. Who wants to live in a world like that? I don't. So that's why Jesus has to make everything what? Everything has to be remade new. At the beginning, when He returns, He's going to make a new heaven. He's going to restore the, the, the stars in the sky and the universe and everything, and He's going to make a new what? A new earth. And everything will be replenished and transformed into something beautiful and new, just like the Garden of Eden at the very beginning. And I think it's going to be even better. Because what God wants for you and me, He wants to provide a place for us, a home. This is our home. Do you know that earth will always be our home? We're from the earth. We're made of the dust of the earth. This is our home. This is our domain. 
He wants to make a home and earth for us that is habitable, that is enjoyable, that is beautiful, that is lush, that is, that is amazing in every single way where the waters are fresh again and the mountains are beautiful again and the vegetation and the trees and the fruit and the fields and the animals and the cities are rebuilt and everything is made better than we could ever possibly imagine. I'll read one more verse before I'm going to ask our praise team to come back up. You guys, come on up. Flip with me real quick. We're going to finish here. Isaiah 65. So Isaiah, he talks about this. Peter draws from this. Isaiah 65. Verse 17. Behold, I create a new heavens and new earth, and the former things shall be... Not, will shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Be glad and rejoice forever in which I create, in the thing that I create. And for behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. What a blessing. And then Isaiah 66, look at the, the last verse here. Isaiah 66, 22. For as the new heavens and new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. Guys, that's what God is preparing for us. And what is He calling us to be? He's calling us to be awake, to be alert, to be ready, to be watching, to be praying. And He's telling us to be prepared so that we are not like the rest of the world living in darkness, who are going to be surprised like a thief in the night, but that we are ready and we're prepared. Now, I'm going to ask one last question before I go. Peter asked this question. What kind of people, with this in mind, considering everything that we've talked about today, he says, what kind of people ought you and I to be? Did you catch that? And he tells us, he says, we should be living in holiness and what? Godliness. What does that mean? Set apart, holy. That means you should be what from the rest of the world? Different. Different. Holy, set apart, and godly. What does it mean to be godly? It means that we're like who? Like God. What does it mean to be a Christian? To be like who? Like Christ. That's it, guys. In view of everything that we're ready for and is coming and what we can expect, we're set apart, we're different, and we're to be like Jesus Christ. So as we go, it's time to wake up, be prepared for the coming of the Lord. And we're going to sing to that end as we finish today, guys. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, let's stand together as we pray. And we're going to sing one more song together in the glory and honor of the Lord. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for just giving us this time to remind us of the sobering reality, Lord, that we need to be awake, spiritually awake, awakened, prepared, waiting, ready, Lord, knowing that your coming, Lord, is at hand and that we have the opportunity, Lord, to right the ship, to repent of sin, to get our lives back to where you want it to be, to be set apart, holy, and to be godly, to be like you, Lord Jesus Christ. Give us, thank you for your spirit to help us in this journey of life as we seek to live to please you, Lord. And I just want to pray for everybody here today, Lord, that they would use this next song and this opportunity not to worry about where are we going next. Don't worry about what's happening next. I just pray for our people right now, Lord, to engage and to sing this song in faith and to do it, Lord, with, with all of their heart, knowing that right now, Lord, we have another chance to worship you. We have another chance to lift up the name of Jesus. It'll never get old in the kingdom. This will never get old in heaven. We're not going to be worried about where we're going next in heaven. We want to sing another song. We're going to want to pray longer. We want to stay with God's people longer, Lord. So help us right now just to, just to put aside our habits and our, and our, 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 our hang-ups and all the things that we are, our schedules, Lord. And I just want our people right now, just for this moment, to sing. And to be present because we know that you're present with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's sing together.
sorry, God. In our hearts, Lord, in this nation, awakening, Holy Spirit, we desire, awakening, for you and you together.
guys. I love you. I want to invite you to come share lunch with us. Internal Bread's got a great meal prepared. I want to say a blessing for that meal. You're all invited. So feel free to hang out, visit, fellowship, and spend some time with us here uh, for this lunch in Jesus' name. Father, thank you so much for this. Thank you for this day. I pray for an awakening, a spiritual awakening. Lord, help it start with us. Help us all know, Lord, that we have a responsibility um, to look inward, that we we're, we're all have areas of our life, Lord, that, that need to get right with you, including myself. And Father, help us to have a greater sense of urgency, uh, to know, Lord, that, that the day of the Lord is, is near and that we have work to do and that uh, we, we need to be ready. We need to be prepared, Lord. We, we need to be waiting and watching and awake. So forgive us of our sin, Lord, and um, help us to continue to strive for you to live for you. And I want to thank you for this meal and, and all of our ministries here at the church, those who are pre- uh, here to prepare it and that you would bless it and bless our time of fellowship. And it's all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great, wonderful week.